Hi everybody. Hi uh, um, Okay, sure. Hi. Um, hey everyone, I'm um, Stefan Kader. I work at Canonical. I'm the LexD and LXC project leader. Um, and with that. And I'm James Page. I also work at Canonical. And I'm the technical architect for OpenStack at Canonical. So we're going to be talking to you about uh, deploying OpenStack with machine containers. And Stefan is going to kick off with a bit of an overview of LexD, which is the underlying container technology that we're using. <laughs> Uh, and then we'll go in a bit more on the, uh, the Nova driver we've uh, implemented as well. So I'll hand you over to Stefan now. All right. Cool. Um, come on. Can I switch. All right. Okay. So um, what's LexD really briefly? Um, it's basically a new LXD experience. We've been working on that for um, a couple of years now. Um, it's, meant, it's designed to be really uh, simple. It comes with a completely redone, you know, Gemini interface. It's uh, got a REST API that you can interact with. You can script with it, script it really easily. Um, it's got a much clearer terminology than we ever did with LXE. It's really clear what you're doing at any time. Um, it is it, it's really ex extremely fast uh, because it's not virtualization. We're doing containers. Um, as you know, no virtualization overhead whatsoever. Uh, basically, raw um, host performance, with the exception of uh, if you set like resource limits, you might have a tiny bit of overhead from the kernel to do the resource limitation. Um, it's very secure. We use every single security feature that exists in the kernel effectively um, to make those containers as safe as you can possibly make them uh, without turning them into a full fledged virtual machine. Um, and it's scalable. It works perfectly fine for your day to day development thing, which is what development on your laptop, which is what I'll show you afterwards. But it also scales to thousands of containers, which is what James will be talking about afterwards if you use it through OpenStack. Um, what, does it kind of, what does it look like? So it kind of, usually in uh, a typical Lexi deployment, you would have multiple hosts. They each run their own Linux kernel. Um, you might run the same one on each of them or not. We don't really care. Um, you run LXC is the, the library um, and that we use to actually talk to the kernel and that we've developed, um, which is then used by LXD, which then exports a REST API that we have clients for. So we've, we ship with command line tools, so what I'll be showing. Uh, people have been writing their own tools, talking to REST API directly, uh, and we've got Nova LXD, which is another client uh, for LXD itself. Now, um, Briefly, what it isn't. Uh, so, as I said earlier, it's not another virtualization technology. Uh, we only focus on containers. We only that those restrict what you can run inside them. But it also gets you um, like a lot more performance, especially for like idle workloads and that kind of stuff. Um, it's not a fork of LXE. It's by the same team that makes LXE. Uh, it's just a nice. It was a nice way for us to reset kind of the Ulex user experience, um, expose LXE to like a multi-host kind of thing, um, and add, like, we do a bunch of things, like it's image-based, uh, yeah. It's not a fork of LXC, it is using libLXC underneath it. Um, it's the least of what it isn't. Uh, <laughs> and it's not another uh, application container manager, in the sense that it's not another Docker, it's not another rocket. We don't care about running a single process, we don't care about what's running inside your container in any way. We take a full Linux distribution, we exec, it, it's in its system, and that's the extent of the interaction we've got with it, the inside of the container. Uh, so long as we've got an init process that we can exec, we are perfectly happy with it. We don't care what you're doing with your container. Um, so it's really the same way as we would, would do for a virtual machine in that regard. All right, um, because we're, it's, I'm gonna try and do a quick demo of what, what we've got right now. Um, before James goes on and talk about the uh, output stack side of it. Um, so, yeah, we've got terminal. All right. Um, so, uh, first thing on that machine, I'm just gonna actually install LXD. Um, I'm using the, the snap package from Ubuntu. We've got a bunch of different ways of installing it on different distros. Um, anyways, um, it's installed. Uh, it's probably generating keys right now in the background. Um, well, it's done already. Um, and so we can just do the first configuration step, which is configuring everything. Um, first, I'm going to use ZFS, uh, have it create a new pool for me. 
uh, called the Pool XD, use it on loop storage right now, default size. Um, I do want XD to be available over the network, um, use default address port, uh, give a password, um, and the rest I don't care so much, I just want default networking and everything. And okay, so XD is configured and ready to run. First thing we'll do is just uh, launch an Ubuntu 16.04 container. Um, so it's going to basically grab uh, the latest Ubuntu 16.04 image for the architecture of that system, which is 64 bit Intel, um, unpack it, uh, read the metadata from it, create a ZFS. Um, file system, because I'm using ZFS as the backend for, for that particular XD. We also do BRFS, LVM, and a bunch of other backends. But ZFS in that case, so it's creating a new ZFS file system, which can then be cloned for all your containers after that, making them really, really quick to create. All right, so that's an Ubuntu container created. Um, now let's do an Arch Linux container, just for good measure. Uh, we've got community-maintained images uh, produced daily uh, for a lot of Linux distributions. Uh, we've got Alpine Linux, Arch Linux, Debian, Gen2, Fedora, uh, CentOS, Server Call Enterprise Linux, uh, probably forgot a few. Um, so there's a good chance your distro, uh, in particular, version of that distro is already available. All right. So I've got those two containers created now. Um, that sadly doesn't really quite fit in the screen, but um, well, if I make it slightly smaller, it might. Uh, well, whatever. Um, but we. So we see two containers running. They've got the IPv4 address, IPv6 address. Fine. Now, can exec, exec a shell inside the Ubuntu container, um, which we've done. Can look at the process list inside there. Um, we basically see init process and the usual systemd suspects and cron and sshd and kind of stuff. But it looks like a full system. Um, now we can go look at things like uh, CPU info. Um, I grab, whoops, come on. Okay, procs, info, grab. All right, so we see we've got eight, uh, eight processors on there because that's what the physical machine has. Um, disk space, we've got the old system right now, so it's the 42 gigs we saw earlier. Um, and memory, we've got 12 gig, that's what the host has. But we can change that live as we want. So set, we want two CPUs, we want one gig of RAM, and we want a disk limit of five gig. Go back inside the container. Disk space is down, down to five gig. Memory is now down to one gig. Um, and if I look at CPU info, we're down to two CPUs. So that's resource management with FlexD. We can also do resource uh, block I/O limits for IOPS uh, to particular devices. We can do bandwidth limit for network, all that kind of stuff. All of that stuff can be applied live um, to our containers. All right, now we've had that second container, Arch Linux, um, can create a snapshot of its current state with snapshot, then we can get the shell inside there, um, and let's install something like uh, Apache. So, okay, Apache is installed, we can query that to make sure that it is, uh, and now let's just restore the snapshot to its that container, there we go, and if we query, it's gone. So you can snapshot and revert extremely quickly. It takes less than a second to snapshot, less than a second to revert anything. Um, so that's like your normal snapshot story. Um, now, LexD, the our command line client tool can also deal with multiple hosts. So I've got another server um, that I can install Git like I do LXC remote add to other remote server. Um, that adds it to the list of the remotes I've got in my client. Um, and I can now do things like list what's running on that remote server, which is nothing. And say I want to start an Alpine container on there. That's done. Can get a shell exactly the same way. That's another network this time. And let's create some random file on the file system and part of that container. There we go. I can now move that container to my other host. So I'm just transferred over the network. It did the ZFS and receive uh, optimized file transfer. And we see it's now on the same machine that's running the Arch, Linux, and Ubuntu container. 
and I can just start it again here. Get my shell in there, and the file is there. Have some questions? Uh, maybe. Yeah, I can try. The point is, it's gonna break my back. Try and figure it out. For fun. Yeah, let's see. What does that do? Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, last thing I've so got. There was one other question, um, <laughs> oh. which I assume wasn't change the contrast. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. So the question is, can that, you live migrate containers between hosts? Right. You, you can live migrate containers between hosts with FlexD, yes. We do integrate with Creo. Uh, we've been doing some work on it. Uh, the fact is, we've not been uh, actively maintaining Creo. It's like a beta, beta kind of state uh, feature, where if we do have interest, interested um, customers, we'd be happy to uh, ensure that your particular use case works. But live migration in Linux means you need to be able to serialize all the kernel state of your workload, which is rather tricky. Uh, and so we can probably make it work for your particular use case if you really care about it. But making it work generically for everyone is something we just don't dive um, enough people to get done, unfortunately. But yes, we do integrate with Creo. If Creo works, then you can live migrate containers as they're running. It's simply, if the container is running and you LXC move, it's going to serialize state, move it, restore it. All right. Uh, OK, I'm going to try and do the last demo really, really quickly before it's James' turn. Um, on my local laptop, one thing that we can do is also device pass through. Uh, so I've got another container called uh, Android, um, oopsie, um, in which I can do ADB devices. It's going to show me that I've got nothing. There we go. Uh, I can add a USB device to it. Um, it will still show me that I've got nothing because my phone is not plugged in. So now if I plug my phone in, I unlock my phone, and I run ADB devices again. Now my USB device has been passed into the container, and I can get an ADB shell, and we can see that the oops, death bus, that the container, that the um, the cell phone has been passed in into the container. So we, we also do that for GPUs. You can pass um, a GPU into the container if you want, and the right dev NVIDIA or dev DRI nodes will be automatically passed for you. Um, all right, back to slides. So really briefly before we go uh, to Nova LXD, just quick recap. Uh, LXD operates on system containers, so we run full Linux distros exactly like a virtual machine, but using containers on Linux. Uh, we have a really re simple REST API to drive all of that. You, you could drive what scale I did through curl um, pretty easily. Uh, we do daily images of most Linux um, distributions, um, and LXD itself is available on a whole bunch of distros. Um, obviously, main focus is Ubuntu, but it's available on Debian through a snap. It's available on Arch Linux in through user repository. And we've got native packages in Gen2 and Alpine Linux, as well as someone's maintaining some packages in user repository for Fedora. That's it on my side. OK, thank you. Uh, so, all right, and for the demo, you just have to do this. All right. OK, so uh, Stefan's gone into uh, machine containers and how we manage them with LexD. So I'm going to talk about how we've integrated uh, LexD into OpenStack with a, with a Nova driver. OK, so if we, uh, we look at uh, KVM, uh, we've got a number of guests running here. Um, we can pretty much simulate exactly the same thing with LexD. Um, those guests are much lighter weight. There's, uh, there's no simulated firmware, BIOS. Uh, you know, it's running on the host kernel, and it's just resource controlled via uh, LexD and the various kernel mechanisms available to it. Um, and we can slide OpenStack between those things to provide a management layer. So um, because uh, LexD container is a machine container, it has very similar semantics to uh, um, a libver KVM uh, virtual machine. So all the, all the things you'd expect to do um, on an OpenStack cloud to a KVM instance, you can do pretty much all of them to um, a LexD container running on a cloud as well. So the, the kind of normal lifecycle management for uh, managing uh, m machines and also uh, resizing, snapshotting, uh, plugging into virtualized networking. So whatever SDN you're using on OpenStack, um, we can pretty much plug into most things these days. Um, and we plug in using the same semantics as a libvirt uh, KVM driver, but without the, uh, the virti OA layer and the, the overhead that brings as well. 
Um, we can also apply um, resource constraints to containers. So uh, Stefan demonstrated doing that on the fly by reducing the number of processor and memories down. But we can we basically can take the flavor mechanism in OpenStack and we can apply that to, to containers as they're created. So memory, CPU, uh, we apply quads to I/O operations, um, and it, in the same way we can apply resource controls to the the, the resources on the machine that container is going to consume. We can also secure the machines. Um, with uh, the, the standard security group mechanisms available in OpenStack. So either IP tables firewalls or native open vSwitch firewalling work, work just fine with a LexD container managed via OpenStack as, as a libvirt container. And we can mi migrate containers between hosts. So Stefan demonstrated this at the LexD level, but we, we can plug into the migrate API in OpenStack as well. And we can also um, do a, a kind of neat trick of exposing an entire hypervisor as what we call an exclusive machine container. So it gives you the whole machine, um, but with the, the container abstraction layer around the processes that the, the user is going to be consuming on the cloud. Um, so they're getting the bare metal performance, they're getting uh, the benefit of being able to plug into whatever SDN is used on the cloud, uh, but without the operational overhead of having to give someone uh, a physical server and the, the complexity that brings in terms of compromising firmware, compromising BIOS, and the hygiene you'd have to do as a cloud operator to be able to manage hardware that you provide to tenants. OK, so I'm not doing a live demo, unlike Stefan. Uh, Windows 10. Uh, go for it. Uh, and I pre-recorded mine this morning, because I was feeling chicken. OK, so um, I've got a, we've got a, a Nova XD deployment in one of our labs. Um, so we're just going to SSH into that and, uh, and take a look at it. Um, right, so the, the normal trouble about getting access to your cloud. Um, let's take a look at the, uh, the services we've got running. Uh, this is a three compute node cloud. We've got three hypervisors and our control plane is actually in LexD containers on top of those as well. Um, I'm not going to talk about that today. Um, so let's have a look at one of the hypervisors. Uh, you can see about halfway down on the second column, this is a LexD hypervisor type rather than a QMU hypervisor type, which is what you typically see with libvirt. Um, we'll also have a look at the neutron, neutron agents running across the cloud. And you'll see that, although that's wrapped a little bit, we can see the open vSwitch agents and the normal L3 and DHCP agents that we run on network nodes. Um, so from a kind of topology perspective, the cloud looks very familiar to anybody who's ever deployed a, a libvirt KVM-based cloud. Um, so we haven't got any instances running at the moment. Um, so we'll, we'll uh, boot a couple of instances, uh, a small one and a large one. I'm too slow, obviously. Here we go. And they should be running pretty quickly. But I can't type fast enough, obviously. <laughs> Why doesn't ASCII seminar trim, trim the gaps? But uh, yeah, so those, uh, those instances are booting, and they should be both active and running. Um, they're just plugged into a private network, which in this case is a GRE overlay network on the back end. So we're using the ML2 Open vSwitch uh, plugin for the networking on the cloud. Um, so we need to add some floating IPs to be able to access these instances. So last optech there is uh, 161 for the small, and should be 140 when we get there for um, the, the large instance. Um, and now we should be able to access them. Oh, no, we won't. Um, I haven't done the security group bit yet. So um, well, right now we can't ping the instance because it's uh, completely firewalled off from the outside world. So um, we'll just have a look at the security group. So we've got the standard egress security group rules that um, all profiles come with in OpenStack. Um, so we'll add uh, ping and SSH ingress from the outside world into, that, into the default group, and then we should be able to access the instances just fine. OK, so we're getting a ping from it. So just check the other one as well. And let's log into one and have a look. So um, have a look at the, the CPU info. You see we've got a, uh, can't see how many cores we've got there. It's just the small, it's the small. It's got one. And it's got um, <laughs> two gig of memory, which is off the top. Um, yeah, I got this one earlier. So, no, nope, still off the top. So, <laughs> it's got two gig of memory. Um, 
And you can see the, the process listing there. It's much trimmed down. There's, there's no kernel processes running, but all the normal things you'd expect in a, a full system, like SSH and syslog and cron and all the other things you need to operate in instance are there. Can I ask you a question in the end? Because this won't wait for me, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, you can see we've got an, I an IP address that's being presented by the LexDLA, and we can see the private IP address there that uh, Neutron has allocated for the instance. And we'll have a, a similar check on, on the large instance as well. We might get to see more CPU informo information here, but let's see. Uh, no, because the number's off the top. But uh, again, this is, this is a, an 8 gig machine with, with four cores rather than the, the one, 2 gig machine with one core that the other one had. and similar process listing as well. So um, hopefully that gives you a flavor that like using a LexD machine container on an OpenStack cloud is a very similar experience to what you would expect with Live, LibVirt KVM. There are still some gaps. Uh, storage is still not a strong point. Uh, we have basic support for uh, the Cinderice SCSI uh, driver, and we're working on support for a Ceph driver this cycle as well. So that should be available in the Okata release towards this end of this month. So we'll quickly talk about benchmarks. So um, Stefan alluded to the fact that you're getting very much bare metal performance. So uh, we've got a few benchmarks to go through, just three. Uh, this is uh, the Hadoop TerraSort benchmark, um, and this is con using the exclusive machine stuff I was talking about earlier, where we give a full machine to, to a container or a KVM instance. So we looked at the total runtime, and bare metal and Nova XD come very, very close. I think the diff there is mainly due to use of overlay networking and the overhead that brings in, in, at the networking layer. KVM took quite a bit longer. We had a number of failed um, jobs that had to be retried so that it did push things out. And I've got a, a few um, latency things as well. So Cassandra Stress has lots of, uh, lots of small writers. So we can see write, write latency with LexD compared to KVM is much, much lower. And again, that results in much, much higher throughput for, for uh, a Cassandra Stress benchmark. OK, so I think we've got about three and a half minutes left now. So if anybody's got any questions, please put your hand up, and I'll repeat them. It, okay. it, it, so the question is, can you use uh, LexD to pin a container to a particular set of processes, processes, oh, sorry, cores on, on the host, so CP, it's doing CPU infinity? Mm -hmm. So, Stefan, do you want to answer that yeah, at LexD so end, level? Yes, you absolutely can. Uh, the, the CPU limits we set, if you just give us a, a strict number of CPUs, we will do load balancing for you. But if you give us a range, say, 1 through 4 or 1, 3 to 4 or something, uh, that will, we will pin you on those particular cores, yes. So the, the, the second part of that is that can you do it through OpenStack yet? Yeah. Uh, not yet, but we'll, we will uh, support the full set of uh, flavor properties that allow you to do that probably by the end of the Pike cycle. So another six months yet. First question is, uh, do you support container resize? Um, yes. So, open, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, obviously, LexD, as I was showing, you can sh set everything live. And that means that you can do resize pretty easily. Yeah, and you can hot plug as well. So if you want to add additional ports to an instance, mm -hmm. uh, you can use the standard semantics via the OpenStack APIs to be able to add additional neutron ports to a container. And that's done as a, a hot plug event and mm -hmm. is picked up as in the container appropriately. And the second question was about uh, whether we, we support the OCI uh, initiative. Uh, we don't, because they mostly focus on application containers. They don't care about running a full distro. Um, so it's not been a great fit in general. Uh, we've been, for LexD specifically, we've been looking at some parts, like the OCI SDN and some of those aspects that could be useful for us. Uh, but the, the image side of it, not, but it's not a good fit, because we care about like, a full, pristine distro image coming from the vendor as opposed to having image source and people doing layers and stuff. OK, there's one at the back, and then you're next. Yeah. Uh, in your example, you showed that you did a backwards to work on data. A backwards to work on the device to work on data. Do you use the IO as a menu in order to secure that? OK, so the question is, the device pass through, was that using IO MMU? No, it's not, because we're using the same kernel as the host, so we're not passing. You can't pass a PCI device into a container just like you can't load a kernel module inside a container. Uh, what you do is the kernel module itself runs on the host, 
get, in this case, was giving me dev, bus, USB devices, and those were being passed into the container. Same thing when you pass a GPU, uh, the NVIDIA driver would be installed on the host, would get to dev NVIDIA devices, then next day would pass whichever of those dev NVIDIA devices you need for the container to use. The, the driver runs the on the same would apply host. to something like an SRIOB virtual function, in that it, it presents as a host device, and that can be mapped into the container. Uh, so, uh, the question is about the uh, risk of DMA attacks against the host. Uh, if you do pass a device that gets you access to the entire uh, host memory, yes, you can absolutely read dual memory. Uh, you have to be careful as to what you pass into the container. All right, time's up. Um, if anyone wants, we've got a bunch of stickers here uh, that you can come and collect if you're collecting stickers. Uh, and thank you very much. Yeah, thank you.